So good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to see everyone today. Uh, the Torah portion is Amor, found on page 717 in the Eitz Chaim, or um, chapter 21 of Leviticus in whatever uh, edition of Chumash you're using. Baruch HaTadonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Shekitshanu B'mitzvotav, Etzivanu La'asof B'divrei Torah. Uh, this portion is uh, mainly devoted to laws related to the Kohanim themselves. And then also it's known uh, uh, more commonly for uh, the section that is read on holidays. So Pesach and uh, Sukkot uh, were familiar with uh, the reading from near the end of the portion, which describes the holidays that are celebrated throughout the year. So, so in other words, this portion continues focusing on the Kohanim and what the Kohanim uh, do um, in the Mishkan, what, both for themselves, for personal um, behavior, and then continuing uh, with a discussion of from the beginning of a book about the sacrifices they offer here, here are the holidays and how the how those holidays are celebrated vis-a-vis -vis the Kohanim. So the the commentary um, begins. Well, the the let, let's just read um, the first couple of verses and and uh, we'll see how the commentary gets into the 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 subject matter. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe, God said to Moses, Emor el hakohanim b'nei Aharon v'amarta lahem. Um, say to the kohanim, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, l'nefesh lo yitama be'amav, um, that, a, um, that they should not become impure to a person in his community. So um, none shall, or more poetically, none shall defile himself for any dead person among his kin. So the Amav, his, his nation is taken to mean his relatives. So a Kohen is not supposed to become impure for his relatives. That what does that mean? Ki ki im li sheero hakarove lav la imo ulavi vilivno ulavito ulachiv. So uh, except for those relatives close to him. That is his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. Vila achoto habitula hakrova elav. Asher lo hayatala ish la yitama. And for his never married sister, it says here also for a virgin sister. It's, uh, I, I think in today's parlance, we could say a, a never married sister who is close to him, who has not been with a man. He can. Uh, imp get make himself impure for her. The uh, understanding here is that in the bracket, in the in the on the third line, none shall defile himself for any dead person among his kin. The English doesn't Excuse say me, that. Excuse us. Where, 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 exactly where are, are you? We're <laughs> at the beginning of the portion Amor on seven seventeen. Seven seventeen. Oh, 17. Okay. 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 Thank you. Sorry. Uh -huh. It's okay. And um, so, um, so that the the, um, the English assumes that the Torah is talking about um, a um, a dead relative. That for them, you, the exceptions for uh, the family that a kohen is allowed to defile himself or to make himself impure are these close relatives. I'm I'm just keeping everybody muted. Uh, these close relatives that you say Kaddish for. Okay. So um that's how we understand from the from the rabbis 
These are the relatives for whom we say Kaddish. Father, mother, son, daughter, brother. And it says sister. Lo yitama ba'al be'amav lehei chalo. But he shall not defile himself as a kinsman by marriage and so pr profane himself. So in other words, this is understood. No, it doesn't mention his, his spouse here. But it does say in this last, last sentence that um, relatives by marriage, you are not, the uh, Kohen is not allowed to make himself impure. So this is um, an interesting thing in that uh, highlighting how different the Kohanim are from the rest of the community of Israel, that the uh, Kohanim are supposed to maintain a higher level of purity than the rest of the community. Um, I just uh, finished reading the first four sentences of the portion Amor, so uh, welcome everyone. So the um, so uh, what I was saying is that it's interesting that the Kohanim have to maintain a higher status of purity than the rest of the community of Israel. Why is that? Uh, possibly because they are engaged in um, uh, sacrif uh, the sacrificial system and sacrifices need to be offered in a state of purity. So even for, um, th there are certain exceptions for close relatives, a Kohen is allowed to, uh, to uh, make himself impure by coming into contact with the dead because they are his close relatives. And so that means that he um, makes himself ineligible to work. So somebody else will have to uh, do the work while he is impure. And when you come into contact with the dead, there is a special purification process you have to go through and it takes a week. Uh, you have to be impure for a week and then you go through the purification process, which is described in Numbers chapter 19. So the question is why? Why, the, why do the Kohanim have to be in this state of extra purity? And what does it mean for the rest of the community of Israel? So below the line, we have this introductory paragraph. Uh, which I <clears throat> I want to share. The, this parasha, this Torah portion, lives up to the book's alternative Hebrew title, Tarat Kohanim, the priest's manual. It focuses on special regulations of Kohanim and then on the ritual aspects of the sacred calendar. The previous portion describes the Israelites as being set apart from other nations, called on to attain holiness through their distinctive lifestyle. This parasha sets the Kohanim apart from other Israelites by means of symbolic obligations, restrictions, and abstentions in their lives. Okay, so symbolic. Today, it's symbolic. In the time of the, of the Torah, if through um, the time of the temple, it wasn't symbolic. Uh, it, so in other words, for today, all the matters of purity are mostly symbolic. In the very traditional Orthodox community, there are uh, married women do go to the mikveh once a month. But um, other than that, nobody else is um, subject to any of these laws of purity anymore. Okay, so uh, e even Kohanim today and Kohanim, um, there are traditional Kohanim who don't attend funerals unless they are. Uh, for their immediate relatives to maintain the symbolic, um, the, the symbolic uh, sense of purity that the Kohen has to maintain. So, and again, it's symbolic because without the temple in Jerusalem, there are no, there is no way to become uh, pure again if we become impure. And all of us are impure all, because we are we have come into contact, whether we know it or not, with the dead. And a contact with the dead is the most um, um, the, the most um, uh, stringent of all pur purifications and 
and uh, impurities that you don't even have to be in the same room. You just have to be in the same building as someone who has died. So uh, if you go to a hospital, you go to a funeral home, uh, then you're, uh, you have to assume you're in contact with the dead. Um, and therefore, there is no way to, um, to, to become purified from that without the, t the temple standing in Jerusalem and the process that is there. So we are all impure. And anything we do, like when we depart a cemetery, we're supposed to wash our hands uh, like we do when we wash our hands before saying hamotzi. Uh, that's just symbolic because that's not enough to make us purified after coming into contact with the dead. Um, but it is symbolic. And so when a Kohen doesn't attend a funeral, again, it's also it's also symbolic. So for me, it doesn't matter. To, I, let me say it this way. For me, I encourage Kohanim to serve on the Hever Kedisha. So the Hever Kedisha is that group of people that takes care of the dead for, uh, for burial, washing and dressing the body for, uh, for burial. And even though a Kohen is not supposed to come into contact with the dead, again, because all of this is symbolic, I uh, encourage Kohanim to serve on, on our Hever Kedisha, because it's more important to take care, to do that mitzvah work than to maintain a, a symbolic sense of purity. Okay, so real, for me, uh, is more important than symbolic. But it gets to this uh, question that the, now the, uh, the um, commentary is going to get to. As the Israelites... Uh, are to represent the God-oriented life to the nations of the world, the Kohanim are to represent a maximal level of devotion to God for their fellow Israelites. So we are supposed, we as the people of Israel, are supposed to be an example to other nations of uh, ethical, moral, righteous living. And the Kohanim are supposed to be examples to us of the highest degree of ethical, moral, uh, righteous living, right? So there's a hierarchy here. There, there are the nations of the world. Then there's the people of Israel who are supposed to be holier, more, more moral than the, than the rest of the world. And then the Kohanim who are supposed to be holier than everybody else. And as, as it concludes, every society needs a core of people who live by a more demanding code to set an example for others of what is possible. So when I read that uh, earlier today, I was struck by that and wondering whether really every society needs a group of people to be holier than everybody else. Because if a society knows that there's a group of people that's holier, then maybe the society can say, well, uh, we can rely on them, on that group, to represent us. And that uh, if I make a mistake, not a big deal, because a mistake in terms of uh, doing something wrong ethically or morally, I don't have to worry about it because there's this group of people who are acting in a, in a more ethical, moral way than me. And I can rely on them to kind of take care of my mistakes. I think that, that partly that's what I'm thinking of when I when I read that sentence. We need, every society needs that core of people. And I'm thinking about the state of Israel today and how the ultra-Orthodox have an exemption from serving in the army. And uh, their argument is, well, we are serving the nation by studying Torah all day. And we, we think that that is protecting the state of Israel by studying Torah all day. And so I think that's a, that's a danger to the Israeli society. And I think it's a danger to any society to think that there's a group of people who's, gonna, who's there acting uh, on behalf of the rest of the people. It, this might be the case in, uh, in the Far East, in... Um, uh, Hindu or Buddhist culture where you have 
uh, uh, monasteries. This could be the case within the Christian world where there are monasteries and convents as well, that perhaps there's this um, implicit idea, this subconscious idea that we don't have to be so good. We don't have to worry about being so good because there's a group of people who's worried about being good for everybody else. So I, I argue with this last sentence here in the commentary that every society needs a core of people who live by a more demanding code. I would only agree with it if that core of people serve as leaders of society and encourage everybody else to be as demanding as they are. All right, so if that group of people doesn't sequester itself, but instead serves as the leader of the nation, then I would I would agree with that. So I think having the Kohanim be this group of people that uh, uh, serve the people and therefore have to live by a higher standard would only work well if they are encouraging all the time the people for the rest of the people to be as good as they can be. So then I want to um, I want to uh, continue in the commentary. The priests, the son of Aaron, uh, so declared. So, uh, in other words, the first verse said God spoke to Moses, saying to speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron. So we know that the Kohanim are the sons of Aaron. Why does the Torah need to tell us that they are the sons of Aaron? Because the only, the only Kohanim at the time right here in the book of Leviticus, are the sons of Aaron, right? That, that, that There aren't more generations yet, and there aren't, those sons haven't, uh, haven't, as far as we know in the Torah, haven't had children yet. So uh, to uh, broaden the sense of the, the, the Kohen community. So the, the question is why, why mention that they are the sons of Aaron when we know that already? So the commentary says, declare these rules to the Kohanim because they are descendants of Aaron. Remind them that, they are, that their distinctiveness is based on their forebears, not on their own merit. All right, so by mentioning B'nai Aharon to the Kohanim, no matter what generation Kohanim are reminded of their behavior, uh, they, are, they are to be constantly reminded of their history. So, um, you know, it's like when we pray every day, three times a day in, in the Amida, for example, we start the Amida as uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. So we're always, we're always reminding ourselves that this prayer isn't just about me, but I'm putting myself in the, uh, 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 in the chain of history. And, and connecting uh, with history. So here, the Kohanim should always be reminded of their history too. Um, and then it goes on, and let them pass on to their children the importance of that lineage and the obligation to be worthy of it. So they have to remember their history and make sure they tell their children to remember their history also. So that's from uh, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. Uh, but then there's another one, tell the Kohanim to be sons of Aaron, indeed, and not on, um, and not only in descent, pursuers of peace and reconciliation as Aaron was. So reading this very uh, uh, differently, and more El HaKohanim, B'nai Aharon. So say to the Kohanim, quote, B'nai Aharon, children of Aaron, end quote. So what does that mean? Uh, according to Jacob Isaac of Lublin, he says that it means that tell the Kohanim to be like the sons of Aaron indeed. So don't just be reminded of your history, but act like the sons of Aaron in terms of, or act like Aaron in terms of who Aaron was, according to the rabbis, that he pursued peace and reconciliation. So now the, co the commentary goes on, the more general idea about the, the role of the Kohanim in, in the society. As public figures, the Kohanim must be role models of dealing with grief and loss. So again, this is about death. 
and then in which relatives they can make an exception for in terms of becoming impure. So as public figures, the Kohani must be role models of dealing with grief and loss, balancing their personal sorrow with their commitment to serving the people and the obligation to accept death as part of God's plan for the world. So in other words, even when dealing with death in their own family, they, they have to serve as role models to the rest of the community. They can't just be mourners. They're all, they are always Kohanim in the process. Okay, so that uh, it, it's a difficult role to fill in that, that they're always going to be public figures. They're always going to be serving God and family comes second. Okay, so that's that's a difficult, difficult thing to do. A Kohen may willingly acquire ritual impurity by coming into contact with the dead body of a family member, for he owes his priestly status to his family of origin. He may not do so, however, for the corpse of a friend or for a relative by marriage. All right, so that's another way to understand why he can make an exception for family members. It's because the family um, is the source of why is a Kohen. But then again, for a child, the child isn't the Kohen's source of his, the parent is the, so anyway, you know, so it's kind of, the the whole idea of the 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 uh, the religious nature of the kohen is a difficult one. In other words, we're used to in the Jewish community today as um, leadership being democratic. Right? There's nothing special about me or my father for being a rabbi. It's just that we decided that we wanted to go to rabbinical school, so we could. So we did. Uh, all of you could go to rabbinical school too, you know, with the requisite background and knowledge. Anybody and everyone can go to rabbinical school. So there's nothing there's nothing special about that um, in um, in, uh, in uh, compared to a kohen. So a kohen is born into it, and when the temple was standing, had no other option but to be a kohen and to then do the work and to know when in the time of the temple in Jerusalem, there were a lot of Kohanim. And so they took turns, there were shifts uh, two weeks at a time when Kohen families would be working in the temple in Jerusalem. So, so, th so there was something special about being a Kohen. There is nothing special in that regard uh, in being a rabbi. So as, as there's a comment, there's a comment below the line on 718. Um, there are um, 10 shoemakers can make a minion, but nine rabbis can't. Okay, so in other words, making a minion, you need 10 Jews to do that. So by being a rabbi, we don't, we don't count twice. There's nothing extra special about us so that if there are eight rabbis in a room, oh, when, then we can do the entire service. No, because there's nothing special about us that uh, makes the crowd holier. It's just that, well, yes, we do have more education than the average Jew, but there's nothing special about us. So it's it's unusual um, since the, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem to think about this group of people that within society that is holier. So we, again, it is symbolic. And there are many conservative synagogues that have done away with the the Kohen Levi status for uh, to to receive the first and second aliyot to the Torah, and have done away with Duchanan uh, because it's symbolic anyway, and it's been two thousand years, and there's nothing more special about them today than anybody else because they are not uh, in a state of ritual purity that everybody else isn't. So because of all of that and the democratic nature of Jewish society today, many conservative synagogues have done away with Rish, uh, Kohen and Levi and just gone to Rishon and Shani. But our congregation, and there are, there are many that have maintained the tradition just because it's important to remember our history and important for Kohen and Levi to remember um, their status and their tribal affiliation, and it's important 
to, uh, to, to, I think it's important to maintain that as well. And to remember when we do Duchanan on the holidays of what it must have been like uh, in the temple in Jerusalem to receive that prayer from the Kohen um, every single day. So there's a question about, um, about maintaining the status today and, and uh, whether anybody uh, comes close to, uh, to the status of the Kohen today. Uh, yes, so what Laurie is writing in the chat, it seems like in some sectors of the Orthodox uh, community revere their rabbis in a way that seem like the rabbis above them. I'm thinking of Chabad, but also others. Yes, in the ultra-Orthodox world, especially the Hasidic world, uh, the Rebbe um, has a almost a holy stature, like what is similar to the Kohen, but in in very different way. Uh, that um, so the 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 Rebbe the, there's an idea of of um, of being at the Rebbe's tish, at the Rebbe's table, and the Rebbe has food in front of him. Uh, I, I, uh, there's never a her. It would never have be a woman Rebbe. It's always a man Rebbe. So it's usually Shabbos afternoon, but it could be any any other time that there's a Rebbe's tish, Rebbe's table. If he's eating something, uh, it is um, common in, in many Hasidic circles to pass that food around that uh, the Rebbe tasted uh, to have, uh, to be, uh, to merit having a little bit of the food that the Rebbe touched. And that if you have a little bit of food that the Rebbe touched, not just that he touched, the Rebbe blessed it, right? Because before eating, we say a bracha. So if the Rebbe said a bracha over this food, didn't eat it all, but you pass it around, oh, the Rebbe blessed this food. It's better than the food that I blessed. So I'd like to have some of those shirayim, those leftovers from the, from the Rebbe. So that in some Hasidic circles, it's like that. And, um, you know, uh, and, there, and in many Orthodox circles, not just in the ultra-Orthodox, whenever the, the rabbi walks into the room, um, the uh, people are supposed to stand uh, as a courtesy to the rabbi. So in, in non-Orthodox worlds, it, it's not the case. Uh, there are certainly rabbis around who uh, let the the title rabbi go to their head and expect that people will uh, revere them, not just respect them, and will always uh, that, expect a certain kind of benefit uh, from um, just because they have the title of rabbi. So, but that's not the case, right? As, as the below the line on 718 says, there's nothing special aside from the level of education that a rabbi has achieved that is more special than anybody else in the community. So, so there is this, um, this balancing of uh, the democratic nature of the community today and uh, that, you know, that Jewish education is there for everyone to achieve. And at the same time, um, the, uh, the, 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 the still the remnants of the, of the status of the Kohen today, that there's just nothing that, uh, you know, there's that old joke. Somebody goes to a rabbi and said, uh, I'd like to be, uh, I want to be a levy. Can you make me a, ra a, a levy, rabbi? And the rabbi said, no, it doesn't work that way. What do you mean? I I'll make a, a, a generous donation uh, to, to your discretionary fund if you make me a levy. Uh, no, no, uh, there's nothing I that you can do. Uh, uh, rabbi, I'll, I'll, I promise you this will be the most generous donation that you've ever received. Why do you want to be a levy so much? Oh, because my father was a levy. My grandfather was a levy. So that's that's a joke that uh, you know that's that it's something you're born to. It's not something you can buy into. And uh, when anybody converts to Judaism, you can't convert to become a levy or a kohen. You convert to be a regular Israelite, uh, like. Uh, 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 like most of us on the screen today. Uh, but uh, since Barbara is on the screen, she's a levy because her father's a levy, but her daughter is not a levy because the levy goes through the father, not through the uh, not through the mother. Okay, so if a 
If a woman who has a levy is married to a levy, her biological child is a levy, but not because of her, that's because of the husband who is a levy, right? And so a levy could be married to a Kohen, a levy woman married to a Kohen man, the child is a Kohen, okay, not a levy. So it, that's how it works. So we can be egalitarian as we are in extending the Kohen and Levi honors to women as well, but the and to allow women Kohanim to Duchen as as we do, but uh, it's under it has to be clearly understood that uh, we maintain the 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 biological nature of our our tribal status as a Jew, that it's our father that uh, that determines what tribe we belong to. It's our mother that determines what religion we belong to. So there, there could be, there are those who would even advocate today that we should give that up too, right? The reform movement has said that if there's a family where one partner is Jewish, one partner is not, and that that doesn't matter. If they have the commitment to raise their children as Jews, then their children are Jewish and there's no need to take the children to the mikvah. So for the for the reform movement, if the husband is Jewish and the, and the wife is not, and they have children and they raise their, cho their children as Jews, then there's no need for the children to go to the mikvah. Whereas the conservative movement and the orthodox movement have maintained uh, the rabbinic um, the rabbinic definition that yes we are welcoming to interfaith couples but we maintain the rule that if um, the husband is Jewish but the wife is not sure you can your children can come to our religious school but the children need to go to the mikveh. There are some arguing in the conservative movement today that we should give that up and that we should be like the reform movement. So, um, uh, and, uh, but I'm not sure how strong of a sentiment that is today uh, within the conservative movement and whether that will change, but if it does change, it affects uh, identity within the Jewish community, right? Because there are, there could be a, someone raised as a Jew within the reform movement who wants to marry uh, someone who's raised Orthodox and then become part of the Orthodox world might not, uh, might see that they are not technically Jewish according to the Orthodox. And it makes for very, very difficult emotional conversations uh, within segments of the community. Uh, it happens in Israel today. Uh, certainly, my uh, my uh, the fact that I'm a conservative rabbi uh, and I've converted people over the years. Uh, my because I'm a conservative rabbi calls into question the Jewishness of the people who convert to Judaism under my auspices. Uh, I was even just asked the question last week by an Orthodox rabbi in our community who questioned. Who saw a? He was asking. This is what he said in an email. I'm asking on behalf of a colleague who saw from a person who converted to Judaism um, a, a document that they had with your name on it and two other conservative rabbis' names on it. This rabbi saying to me, "I know you, but I don't know those two other rabbis." And that other rabbi friend of mine wants to know if you're all Shomer Shabbos. So that's, a, that's, the, uh, that's the question that um, within the Orthodox world today, it's not necessarily the kind of rabbi I am, but whether I'm Shomer Shabbos, whether I observe the, the laws of Shabbat, which means in this, in this regard, do I walk to Shul on Shabbat or just or, uh, say it this way? Do I not drive on Shabbat? That's what Shomer Shabbos means. What happens inside my house? Do I turn on the lights? Do I cook? It mainly, do I not drive? So I um, I had to answer this. So I, <laughs> it, it raised it. 
I wanted to answer the question to this rabbi, and then I didn't want to answer the question. I said, it's a shame that the process of conversion isn't what's important, but rather the signatures that's important. In other words, as long as the person who converts to Judaism um, studied and went to the mikvah, isn't that, and, and sat before a bait dean, isn't that more impor important than the, whether the bait dean was Shomer Shabbos or not? So if the process happened correctly, why does the signature, the person signing, and their st status affect the person's conversion? So the, the, that Orthodox rabbi did not answer that question. And um, but so this is still an issue within the within the within the Jewish community today. The status of uh, of rabbis vis-a-vis -vis other rabbis, and I, and I'm uh, about to have a conversation on Sunday with a with a religious school family uh, in our congregation just to talk about this very thing, where the husband is Jewish, the wife is not, and they're son is in our religious school and I have to have a conversation about needing to take the child to the mikveh as a formal affirmation of uh, the Jewishness of their family. And I'm worried about how that's going to come across. And uh, I hope that um, they will see that it is, I'm not questioning their Jewishness, that I just need to affirm the Jewishness by going to the mikvah. So it, it's a matter of finding the way to say it the right way that is not being judgmental of them, that is not putting an impediment in front of them. It's not making them think we made the wrong choice by coming to this synagogue. We should go to a different synagogue instead where our choices are not questioned. You know, it's, um, it's I, I hope that, um, that this conversation will go well and that um, we will uh, be able to affirm uh, their son's Jewishness by going to the mikvah. So uh, it is it is a, a a problem a problem or a challenge in our community today. Um, Can I go yes, back so, to the original subject we were talking? Yeah, please. About. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, we I mean, this is very interesting, but yeah. Um, when were all the rules of ha handling a, 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 bo a body, a dead body, created, like uh, washing and dressing uh, and right. lamentations and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So all of that is um, is is set by the rabbis, and then um, more uh, and even more over over the centuries as uh, burial practices kind of are a little bit different from one part of the world to another within the Jewish community. So there's nothing, what we have in the Torah is the idea of ripping our garment. So like wearing the black ribbon or in more traditional circles, actually cutting our shirt or some other garment as a sign of mourning. That's from Jacob and the story of Joseph and his brothers. So the that part is from the Torah, the act of... Um, sitting in mourning for seven days or 30 days. That's from the Torah also. We have it with uh, with Miriam, the death of Miriam, the death of Aaron, the death of Moses, okay? But, uh, but the washing of the body and the burial of the body in shrouds, that the, uh, the Torah doesn't, and, and the Bible doesn't talk about, that we get from, uh, from the rabbis. So, and they, and they, and they um, interpret back into the Torah. So in other words, how do we learn to be compassionate? Uh, the Midrash teaches just as God uh, washed Moses's body and buried Moses, so too should we take care of the dead in that way. So the Torah doesn't say anything about God washing Moses' body or anything like that. It, it implies that God buried Moses because like, Moses died on, ta on top of Mount Nebo and uh, was buried there. So who buried him? Because nobody went up to the mountain with him, the Torah says. So the Midrash says that God buried him. So the, it's from that Midrash and other sections of rabbinic literature, the rabbis developed 
uh, the, the, the burial practices. Um, so uh, again, but it's on very uh, thin ice in terms of how how they based their their laws because um, you know it's only fleeting references that the rabbis then interpret to to determine the laws of uh, washing the body and dressing the body in a shroud and and how to bury a body uh, and etc. All right, in the, in, the, in the time we have left, I want to look at the end of the portion because there's something interesting about the end of the portion um, that, uh, that we find in the commentary as well. Um, so the end of the portion, the seventh Aliyah, chapter 24, gives us uh, some other laws. This is page 731, 32, 33, chapter 24 of Leviticus, the seventh Aliyah, Various other laws that uh, uh, that apply to the Mishkan itself, uh, the, the menorah, the lighting of the of the menorah every day, keeping the fire burning, uh, the 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 uh, two um, loaves of bread that have to be out, and then there's some uh, there's some laws about uh, blasphemy and other crimes. Um, so verse seventeen to the end, I want to look at. The ish ki I'm on the bottom of 732 onto 30, 733, beginning with verse 17. The ish ki akeh kol nefesh adam mot yumai. A person who uh, kills another person, he shall be put to death. Umake nefesh behema yeshal mena nefesh tachat nefesh. And if you kill an animal, you shall pay for it uh, life for life. Okay, the ish ki ten mum ba amito ka asher asa ken yaselo. If anyone maims his fellow as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Shever tachat shever, ayin tachat ayin, shein tachat shein, ka asher yiten mum ba adam ken yinaten bo. So a, a break for a break, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. As he causes damage in a person or injury in a person, so should be done to him. Okay, so in, in the book of Exodus, we found eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and now in Leviticus, we find it also. So I just, I first, I just want to point out that Exodus, parts of Exodus and parts of, of Leviticus, according to biblical scholars, are written by different authors there there are the there's the j strand the e strand and the p strand of of authorship that so the j is stands for yud hey vav hey uh so whenever god is referred to as yud hey vav hey that's the j author whenever god is referred to as elohim that's the e author and then all the rules like in the book of leviticus that's the p author or if there's any genealogy that's usually a, a applied to the P also. So here we have the P author giving eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And then we have in Exodus, which could be the E or the J author giving eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So it's a, so that means that among all the strands, oral traditions that went into the writing of the Torah, that's if we buy into uh, human authorship of the Torah, that, that it was common knowledge and common practice, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But for the rabbis, also, it's understood. It's not meant literally. It's meant figuratively. That the cost of damage of, let's say, I, I somebody breaks my finger, uh, I, I, I am entitled to the monetary worth of that finger. I'm not entitled to break that same finger on the person who broke my finger. Okay? So the rabbis understand monetary. So where do they get that from? And so here, below the line on 733, we get uh, one uh, source of the reasoning of the rabbis why we should understand eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, figuratively and not literally. So uh, below the line on 733, as he has done, so shows shall it be done to him. Saadia. So Saadia Gaon was a great Jewish thinker uh, in this transition time between the Talmudic rabbis and the rabbis of the 
of the Jewish community in the Muslim world, that is the Jews of Spain. So uh, Saadia Gaon lived around 900, 1000 CE, just around uh, 100, uh, 100 years before Ibn Ezra, who was a great Torah commentator who lived in Spain, and like 200 years before Maimonides, who also was born in Spain. So Saadia Gaon, just Google Saadia, uh, you'll see uh, this, this, uh, what uh, historically who he was. So Saadia sought to prove that the verse refers to monetary punishment as the sages suggested, rather than retaliation, uh, by citing the story of Samson in Judges 15. Samson says of his attack on the Philistines, as they did to me, I did to them. Yet what he did to them was not literally as they did, but instead what they deserved. So I looked at Judges 15, and there's a back and forth that happens between Samson and the Philistines. The Philistines attack, the Philist uh, Samson leads an attack that is not quite the same, but it, but more damage is inflicted. So it is not the same amount. So in other words, the Philistines didn't kill 300 people and then the Samson killed 300 Philistines. No, Philistines did something and, the, and Samson did even more to teach a lesson. So what is quoted there in, in Judges 15 is, as they did to me, I did to them. So it seems that literally the book of Judges says that Samson says that he did exactly, um, he, retaliate, he retaliated exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for the, Ka'asher uh, asu uh, li, Cain asiti lahem. It's it's verse eleven in Judges fifteen. As they did to me, so I did to them. But that's not true. If we look at the verses that came before, Samson did more to them than they did to him. So uh, here, Samson is not being literal, but we but it's the Bible. And shouldn't Samson, as a judge, as a leader of the people, shouldn't he be speaking truth, literal truth? If he didn't speak literal truth, then we can say, like Sadia is saying here, that the Torah doesn't mean literal truth here necessarily, that this allows us to, to uh, interpret eye for an eye, uh, not literally. It's the value of the eye for the value of the eye. Okay, so it's just an example. I, I just bring in this here and spending time on this just to show that uh, as an example of the rabbinic methodology in interpreting the Torah. Torah seems to, to teach literal eye for an eye. It seems to be a, a moral and ethical principle. Is there anything wrong with eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? In the time of the Torah, maybe it's not wrong. Somebody gouges out my eye, then I'm entitled to gouge out the eye of the person who gouged out my eye. Seems straightforward and seems to make sense and it could serve as a good deterrent as well for people uh, not to uh, intentionally hurt anybody. So it doesn't seem to be anything ethically, morally wrong with it. But by the time of the rabbis, it seemed ethically and morally suspect. And therefore, they came up with a different way to understand it ethically and morally. Okay, so for the rabbis, the, the, there is an understanding. Ethics and morality change over time. And that the rabbis have the right to institute the new understanding of ethics and morality into the Torah itself. Okay, so this is just one example of several from the Torah, like um, uh, that the, um, the, the law that a parent can execute their rebellious child. Uh, also, the rabbi said never was and never will be. Okay, so... The things that are ethically and morally repugnant, repugnant to the rabbis from the Torah itself, the rabbis give themselves the authority to change the Torah. So that's that's the rabbinic methodology in a nutshell, that it is uh, tradition and change, which is the slogan of the conservative movement, that, that, that were the founders of the conservative movement 150 years ago 
uh, said that we carry on the methodology of the rabbis, that we, we understand that we have the right to continue to interpret the Torah uh, within the parameters of the halachic system uh, to fit our time today. Sometimes Some laws can can remain, like uh, keeping kosher. There's nothing ethically and re morally repugnant about uh, separating meat and milk uh, or not eating pork. So uh, that's that's religious law. That's not ethical and moral law. That's not going to change. But how we understand um, people who are homosexual and their role in the community, how we understand uh, punishment, etc. These are things that do change over time, and uh, we have the right to continue to study, uh, interpret, and potentially to change. So that's uh, that's what I wanted to say today about the portion and more. I hope everybody has a any any. Can I have can I have a comment? Ahead, yes. The comment is when you're talking about the impurity of the uh, priest. Yeah. You know, all those sacrifices, I have this vision of blood everywhere. Right. And, you know, they're taking out the guts and they're turning on fire. And that doesn't seem like an, a purity thing. Right. That's just. So, yeah. Question, so, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Answer that. Go ahead. Answer yeah, that. Yeah. So the, um, so, uh, you know, some people think that the, the laws of purity and impurity relate to uh, sanitary or hygiene conditions. And it's, yes, it's similar to that, but it's not. So um, it's not a matter of hygiene or sanitation or health. Uh, it's, it's not about dirt or filth. It's about the, um, the, the object itself. Blood is holy. Blood, uh, when it is when an animal is slaughtered properly, the blood has to be drained from the animal. So the blood is holy. It doesn't make the person who slaughters the animal unholy. But uh, it, de it depends, though, in what context blood is flowing. If it's flowing from a religious context, like slaughtering an animal, uh, in the slaughterhouse or Kohen slaughtering it for sacrifice, then that doesn't make one impure. But if it's flowing from a woman's body uh, that, uh, as a result of natural flow once a month or after uh, a wound uh, or after childbirth, then that does make one uh, impure. So, so it's not even about the... Um, the, the the liquid itself, it depends on the context in which this liquid is found, right? And so the person, the person who is impure, what, what makes a, a leper, the person with a skin rash, impure? It's um it's because the the status of the of the inflammation itself is impure. It doesn't mean that the person then becomes impure. It's the inflammation that is impure. So it's 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 complex. It's nuanced. This whole conversation about impurity and purity, and what what makes one pure, what what makes uh, something pure or impure. It's random. It's seemingly random laws set down by God, right? So that um, you know when you build a sukkah. Why you can only build a, the roof of the sukkah with something that grows from the ground? Why there are so many other objects that we can use to build a roof of a sukkah today that could serve as a better roof? No, it's caused. That's what God said. So th this is the rule. So it's the, the rules of of purity are the are the same things that it it might we might be tempted to think it has something to do with health and hygiene. But it, but it doesn't. It's, it's about uh, an aspect of uh, life, life-giving powers to these, to these fluids. It's about um, a sense of, of holiness that can be maintained in an unholy world. Okay. The other one is uh, at the end you were reading about um, if you uh, kill a beast, you have to make yeah. restitution. Well. Is the uh, 
when they're making the sacrifices, are we talking that maybe the lambs and the cows and the oxes and whatever are not beasts or? Oh, they... oh, oh, no. I, what the context for this at the end of the portion is about your going into your neighbor's uh, yard and killing an animal that way. It's not about sacrificing. Sacrificing is giving your own animal to offer up. That's not what that law was about. It's about um, you injuring your neighbor's uh, animal. And then uh, pay, is a, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole series of laws in the Mishnah and in the Gemara about injuring neighbor's property and mainly their animals. And then what, what you are supposed to do to uh, pay them back for the injury that you've caused, whether you've killed the animal on purpose or you've uh, injured the animal on purpose. Um, it's depending on the animal, you have to pay back uh, two, three, four times the value of the animal, depending depending what kind it is. But that, it's it's in that context of of a criminal act of uh, injury to property, not uh, offering an animal for sacrifice. Totally different context. Okay. 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 So have a Yashir good Kohak. rest of the day, everybody. Yashir Kohak, Jonah. Okay. Good day, everybody. Thank you.